Hey, it's Saoirse, and we're starting off here with Springer because he desperately wants to be in this. Isn't he so cute? Alright, now he's gonna walk in front of the camera the whole time. Whoa, not before he scratches me to pieces. Okay, off to a good start, wouldn't you say? Today I'm coming at you with Shakespeare, The World as Stage by Bill Bryson. Take a look at that. Um, I got this a while ago because I'll buy anything that Bill Bryson writes, absolutely anything. And I thought, wow, Bill Bryson, my favorite travel writer, and Shakespeare, uh, one of my biggest inspirations. Put them together and it's got to be good. Sorry, this is a little bit erratic right now. Um, yeah, that's how it's going to go today. So, anyway, this is a very short book, but it's not super easy to read because it's very, you know, it's, ah, always caught in my hair. It's historical, it's factual, it's, um, it was different. It was the first time I read Bill Bryson and he wasn't doing travel writing. It was like, I thought he was going to be, I thought there would be more of his, like, typical wit and, and funny things put in there, but he, he didn't put too much of his own opinion, too much of his own. He, he did put some, because it's Bill Bryson, but um, there wasn't a ton of his own thought, um, thoughts on Shakespeare and Shakespeare, uh, not critics, but historians. Come on. Should I just start over? Nah. Forget about it. So I'm wearing my Shakespeare shirt. It says, be not afraid of greatness. I don't know why I don't have more Shakespeare clothes, because I have a ton of Shakespeare stuff, but not clothing. Like, I have these. I thought these were funny. Focus. My mom got me this card, and she also got me this card. William Shakespeare. Yeah, she knows me. So... This book is part of a, a series called Eminent Lives, where they picked like really well-known authors to write about well-known people. Um, so Bill Bryson says like by the time they got to him, a lot of people were taken already, and he saw that nobody had picked Shakespeare. Um, and then he realized, well, that was kind of a, a big thing to take on. And that's really because we don't know a lot about him. and. That's the funny thing about this book, and he says, you know what, I might just read it to you. Where is it? Oh, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Um, no, I'm not going to read it to you, apparently. Or am I? I will, eventually. Um, but basically, yeah. We don't know all that much about him like we think we do. Uh, he's such a big figure and such a prominent figure in literature. They say that like the most quoted whatever, everything that's quoted is like the Bible, Shakespeare, or Greek mythology. Those are the three big things. So he's a big deal. Um, I really liked how he talked about like spelling in Shakespeare's time, like they said that he spelled his name, I can't remember how many different ways, it was like between 5 and 10 or 15 different ways that they spelled Shakespeare and none of them are the way that we spell it now. Um, like every signature we have that we that we're pretty sure is his own handwriting, he spells his name differently. Um, and I like this part that said, Elizabethans were as free with their handwriting as they were with their spelling. Handbooks of handwriting suggested up to 20 different, often very different, ways of shaping particular letters. Depending on one's taste, for instance, a letter D could look like a figure 8, a diamond with a tail, a circle with a curly Q, or any of 15 other shapes. A's could look like H's, E's like O's, F's like S's, and L's. In fact, nearly every letter could look like nearly every other. Complicating matters further is the fact that court cases were recorded in a distinctive lingua franca known as courthand, a peculiar clerical Latin that no Roman could read. It used English word order, but incorporated an arcane vocabulary and idiosyncratic abbreviations. Even clerks struggled with it, because when cases got really complicated or tricky, they would often switch to English for convenience. I think that's hilarious. And I've noticed that. When you look at stuff written from back then, like, the letters are just all over the place. Like, the 
the S's being F's, that makes no sense to me. I don't know if it ever made sense to anyone. Um, someone said that we have not one certain fact of any type for the first 30 years of Shakespeare's life other than that he most assuredly existed somewhere. And that about says it all. To answer the obvious question, this book was written not so much because the world needs another book on Shakespeare as because this series does. The idea is a simple one, to see how much of Shakespeare we can know, really know, from the record. Which is one reason, of course, it's so slender. <laughs> Makes sense. Okay. Mm it wasn't so much a matter of how many words he used, but what he did with them, and no one has ever done more. It is often said that what sets Shakespeare apart is his ability to illuminate the workings of the soul, and so on, and he does that superbly, goodness knows, but what really characterizes his work, every bit of it, in poems and plays and even dedications, throughout every portion of his career, is a positive and palpable appreciation of the transfix transfixing power of language. A Midsummer Night's Dream remains an enchanting work after 400 years, but few would argue that it cuts to the very heart of human behavior. What it does do is take and give a positive satisfaction in the joyous possibilities of verbal expression. Ooh, that says it very well. I believe so firmly in the power of language and words and, and what Shakespeare did with them, you can't deny. It's incredible. Okay. <laughs> Perhaps nothing speaks more eloquently of the variability of spelling in the age than the fact that a dictionary published in 1604, a table alphabetical of hard words, spelled words two ways on the title page. I like those fun facts. Oh, this is really cool to me because he had such, a, such an influence on our language, the language that we still speak today. Thanks in no small measure to the work of Shakespeare and his fellows, English was at last rising to preeminence in the country of its creation. It is telling, observes Stanley Wells, that William Shakespeare's birth is recorded in Latin, but that he dies in English as William Shakespeare, gentleman. Very cool. I get, it's just like with Charlotte Bronte, I get very, like, worked up and I'm too stoked to think. Um, it's ridiculous. But just, just what he did for English, it's insane. You know how many words he invented? I can't tell you because I forget, but if you know, tell me. How many words did he make up himself in his plays? It's a lot. Bear with me while I find this page. Oh, so toward the end of the book, he goes and explains how many people think that Shakespeare didn't really write the plays. And there are a lot of critics that, that have all these theories about, oh, this person wrote them or that person wrote them. It, wasn't, it couldn't have been Shakespeare because of his upbringing. Like, they think that there's no way that this guy would have known everything that he knew, that he couldn't have been so smart or worldly. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, it says, so it needs to be said that nearly all of the anti-Shakespeare sentiment, actually all of it, every bit, involves manipulative scholarship or sweeping misstatements of fact. Shakespeare never owned a book, a writer for the New York Times gravely informed readers in one doubting article in 2002. The statement cannot actually be refuted, for we know nothing about his incidental possessions. But the writer might just as well have suggested that Shakespeare never owned a pair of shoes or pants, for all the evidence tells us he spent his life naked from the waist down, as well as bookless. But it is probable that what is lacking is the evidence, not the apparel or the books. We just don't know. We just don't have... We have almost no record of him writing in his own words and not, um, not in a play. We have, like, one letter that he wrote. And, like, all the people that knew him died off before historians really thought to ask them about him. It's really quite a mystery, but I, I do tend to believe that 
He did write the plays. You know, I want to be optimistic about that. I believe that he wrote the plays. Um, but it does point out in this book that Shakespeare, of course, takes a lot from other writers, like, of the past. He said, someone said that he was a great storyteller as long as somebody else had told the story first. It's true, like, Romeo and Juliet, that's based on a ton of other things, and, I mean, most of the plays are. Um, but he did it so well, and so powerfully, that I don't think we really mind, do we? So I actually just finished up performing in Much Ado About Nothing, and it was so much fun. I played Margaret, Hero's Maid, and I really liked that character. I, I, I definitely connected to some of her lines, especially, God match me with a good dancer. And God, keep him out of my sight when the dance is done. Just perfect. I love that. Um, it's such a funny play, and we had a great time doing it. That was my <clears throat> fourth time performing with this St. Pete Shakespeare Festival. I did... What did I do? Twelfth Night. I was Sebastian. I did Marcellus and Hamlet. And I was a narrator in Julius Caesar. I'm kind of an extra. Um, so yeah, it's really, really special to be able to perform his words. Like, I would just sit on the side of the stage at night when I wasn't in some scenes, and I would watch and just think about, like, how many hundreds of years have passed since Shakespeare was alive and and writing these plays, and, and people were watching them, and, you know, what did they think, and did they understand them better than audiences do now? But people still love them, and I think that's, it's so, it really speaks to the transcendent power of language and art, um, that it can span so many generations, and, and people still love it just the same. Uh, yeah, I could go on a lot, but I'm kind of worried that my memory card's going to run out, so if I just, like, ghost on you guys in a second, I'm sorry, I'm not going to edit this, because, yeah, I still don't know what I'm doing. But... Yeah, I could say more, but anyway, um, this is pretty cool. Like, you're not gonna, it's not a huge book, you're not gonna learn, like, you do learn a lot, though, that's the thing, is that it's so short, but that's just all we know, that's all we know about Shakespeare, and, yeah, so I recommend it, um, but it just, I wanted more, I wanted more of Bill Bryson's thoughts. But I guess it was probably not appropriate for this um, series he was writing for. Um, so, I'm reading a couple books right now. And I'm trying to think about what what can I bring with me while I'm hiking. Because I said that I'm going on a hiking trip. It's going to be about three weeks long. And I'm trying to read four books a month. So that's like, that makes me think, geez, I need to read three books while I'm hiking. And I'll probably do a couple audiobooks. But I really wanted to bring one physical book, so I think I'm going to do like a poll um, on my Instagram if you guys want to weigh in on what I should read. I'll put up a few options. Get your opinions. I want to bring something obviously not heavy, so it's, it can't be heavy and it can't be, it can't be in super good condition because I don't want to destroy it. Maybe like one of my used books, I'd rather bring one of those. So, uh, we'll see about that, and I'll be coming at you soon with another video. Again, I'm playing catch-up, another book that I read last month. And then finally, maybe next week, I'll get up one that I, I read this month. So, is that it? Is that really? No, I'll say a bit more. I think I have time um, on, on Shakespeare. I just... Uh, I can't speak. I love seeing his work performed. You know, they say it's it's meant to be seen and not read. And like, of course, I, I enjoyed studying Shakespeare in, in college and reading it and analyzing it and, and learning about how it fits into the time period in which it was written and how it influenced um, theater for centuries to come. But seeing it performed live, it, it I hadn't really seen it until a few years ago when I was traveling in Europe for months and I 
found myself in London and managed to get to um, see the mid I saw Midsummer Night's Dream and Macbeth at the Globe. And then later that year I also saw, uh, what were they calling it? It was Cymbeline, but they were calling it Imogen. They'd like really modernized it, it was wild. Um, but so like when I saw that first one, I think the first one was Midsummer. I was blown away, you guys, because I had just read these words on paper and like seen some old films, film versions of them, but to see them in the globe, crazy professional performance, there's just nothing like it. It is, it is truly unbelievable. Like I came out of those performances and had to sit by the Thames and just kind of like... <laughs> I don't know what to do now, I can't think, this is, it was just all too gorgeous. So, if you get a chance to see anything at the Globe, don't pass it up, please. And I hope to perform in more Shakespeare plays in the future. It's definitely, it's a memorable experience. I mean, I don't do like a ton of acting, but um, I wish I did. But Shakespeare's just, it's got such a special place in my heart. I think this guy is ready for me to be done, so I'm gonna stop rambling now and uh, let you guys go, and I'll see you soon, alright? Thanks for watching. Bye.